So my presentation is on cranial cruciate ligament injuries in canines. Um, so to start it off, I'm going to do a little anatomy. Um, in case you can't tell, the purple line there um, is the cranial cruciate ligament. And so there's the caudal cruciate ligament that's the green one that goes in the opposite direction. And they connect the femur and the tibia together. So it's like the ACL in humans. Um, and it just prevents the tibia mm -hmm. from going um, forward relative to the femur and it keeps the knee from hyperextending. Could you go uh, back to that one just a little bit? It's, um, the, you know, it's hard to remember what ligaments do versus tendons, because I was just teaching that last week in ANSI 230. And I always think um, ligament means ligate to me. When you do sutures, that's ligating, and that's kind of like doing bone to bone, mm -hmm. uh, ligating the bone, and tendon is muscle to bone. And then I like your idea of this, the human equivalent, basically, uh, of the ACL. So it's really the human equivalent. Shouldn't it be human equivalent? In Probably. humans, it's called anterior. And when you talk about anatomical terminology, humans and primates are different because they stand upright. And so this is anterior, that's posterior. But in four-legged animals, you would say uh, cranial. That's more forward versus caudal. So it's a little thing about anatomy there. Okay, go ahead. Okay, um, so just a little bit more to get some more details. So there's the cranial cruciate ligament again, and the caudal cruciate ligament goes in the opposite direction. Um, but then some other important spots are the medial meniscus, which is this here, that provides like a cushioning between the two bones, and then the patellar ligament, which is up here, which is another one that I'll mention in a minute. And okay. again, go back to that one, because remember, yeah. we're partners. And then you would find fluid in here, and what would that fluid be called? Synovial. Synovial fluid, that, the ultimate lubricant. Okay, so some of the risk factors for the injuries. Um, obviously, obesity is pretty important. Um, the extra weight adds extra pressure on the joints and can increase the risk of that. And then older dogs are also more susceptible to it, because as I'll get into in a minute, um, over time, it's more of a degenerative, degenerative <coughs> injury rather than like a traumatic injury in humans. Um, so it's something that happens more over time. And then there's also a genetic component that they've linked to it. Um, so some breeds are more susceptible than others, especially the labs in the Newfoundlands and then a few others that I listed. And then when it is ruptured, um, it'll be like this where you have the two parts here and they're separated and the tibia will be able to move forward like that, which is pretty painful and difficult to walk for them. So some of the symptoms, as you can see with the dog here, he's like not putting that leg down all the way. So he's got toe touching lameness and he's not weight bearing. Um, and then they'll also obviously have difficulty jumping and running. And if it's over an extended period of time, they can start to lose some of the muscle in those back legs. Um, and then once there starts to be some damage to the medial meniscus, you can also start to hear a popping sound as those bones are rubbing together. So they'll start for diagnostics by observing the gait and looking for those symptoms that I mentioned. Um, and then you can also take x-rays to rule out other conditions and possibly see if there is a tear. Um, you can't really see the ligament super well, super well on x-rays, um, so that's not definitive. But the drawer test, which I'll show here, um, is the most definitive way of seeing it. And so when the dog is sedated, they'll move the tibia forward like that and see if they can get it to move. Um, and if the ligaments obviously there are not ruptured, then it won't move like that. But if it is, you can tell. So that was a dog with the CC. Yeah, 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 that one yeah. is torn. Because it's moving, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the tibial thrust test is pretty similar, but a little bit less definitive. Okay, and one before we move on, because yeah. I'm always trying to add things. One time on a test, I had defined gait, G-A-I-T, right? You know what one student wrote down? The opening in a fence. <laughs> <laughs> Just throwing a little, this is true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the surgical treatments that we have, there's the MRIT, the TPLO, and the TTA. They all have longer names, but that's usually what most people call it. Um, and as I mentioned before, the ruptures with dogs are usually something that happens over an extended period of time, rather than in humans when you hear about an ACL tear, it usually happens like during sports or something. Um, so the treatments for those are going to be slightly different because of the fact that it's more degenerative. 
So with the MRIT, as you can see in the picture, that blue line is the suture that the doctor will put in. Um, it's an extra capsular repair, so that means that they do it outside of the joint. Um, and it basically mimics the function of the CCL, so they add the suture in to do what the CCL would usually do. Um, but it's not recommended for large or active dogs because of the fact that it's just sutures holding it in place. Um, so it's a lot more of a risk to break if you have a large dog. Um, but it is cheaper and less invasive than the other surgeries, so there are benefits to it. Now, do you know what kind of suture that is? It's pretty strong. I think, I don't know exactly what it is. Might Something anybody know for sure? Because see, you know, some suture is absorbable, but uh, there's this stuff called, we used to use it cheap when we went back into multiple surgeries, monofilament nylon, but I'm not sure if that's what it is or not. Might, might be my guess, but a very good... Uh, I've heard people compare it to a really strong fishing line, yeah, but I don't know yeah, exactly yeah, what it yeah. is. Okay. Okay, and then the TPLO is the one that's most recommended by doctors. Um, so this one will make a cut right, right there, um, and then they'll shift the bone over so that so that it's at a 90 degree angle with the patellar tendon, um, and they'll suture or they'll put it into place with the bone plate and screws, and that'll change the like biomechanics of the knee joint so that it can function again. And obviously, since this one uses more solid pieces to put it together, it's more recommended for the larger and active dogs, but it is or more expensive than the MRIT, and it requires um, more of a specialty from doctors. Do you have any idea of the cost of that one? Um, it depends a lot on which clinic you're at. Okay, so I, if you have a range then? Yeah, I think for the MRIT, it's been like two to 3,000, and then the- You mean the last one we just taught, saw? The first one, yeah. That one? Yeah. Two to 3,000? That's what I've heard. I don't okay. know if anybody knows anybody? other values. I mean, it's all very delicate surgery. Yeah. It's not done right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, okay, two to three thousand, let's say. And then I think for the others, like three up. Three up, three yeah. plus. It depends a lot on the area, so mm -hmm. it's hard to say exactly. Okay. Just trying to get an idea. Yeah. Uh, and then the TTA is the newest one that they've come out with. It's pretty similar to the TPLO as far as price and the types of dogs that they'll put into it. Um, but they do the same thing of changing the biomechanics of the knee, but they make a cut along the front of the tibia and move that forward a little to make the angle with the patellar tendon. Um, and they'll suit, or they'll put it in place the same way with the bone plate and the screws. Um, so usually the decision between that and the TPLO just kind of depends on the specific dog and the doctor's preference. And what, what about cost? Probably in the thousands then. I, yeah, I think it's about the same as the yeah. TPLO. Okay. Um, so then after the procedure, obviously they're going to have a pretty big scar um, because they do have to open it up quite a bit. And depending on the procedure, it can be anywhere from like 6 to 16 weeks of rehab. Um, so it's quite a commitment. Um, and about 40 to 60 percent of the dogs will develop an injury in the other leg as well. Um, so that's something to take into account when you're thinking about the price. Uh, but it's not recommended that you do both knees at the same time, obviously, because that greatly increases the chance of complications. Um, but usually the post-surgical complications are only about 7% of the CPLO patients, so that's pretty successful. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't usually remove the bone plate unless there is a complication, but there has been some research that I found that said that it could be beneficial to take it out, actually. And then if you choose to forego treatment, um, there are pain management and joint supplements that you can look into and talk to your doctor about. Um, and then you'll obviously have to modify their exercise to prevent them from causing more damage to it or other areas. Um, and then there's a lot of success that I've seen from using the braces, like this little guy's modeling. Um, those seem to help a lot with supporting the injured limb. But it's not recommended for dogs that are over 50 pounds, because that is a lot of weight to be putting on an injured limb. Um, and it's also not recommended to push the treatment off if you are considering surgery, because the longer you wait, the more difficult it will be. And the more damage at that treatment, right. that's for sure. Yep, and that's all I've got. Questions, comments, I'll let you point. Yeah, yeah. okay, so when I went through, I drew my TL, like five, six years ago, um, they did a hamstring graft, so like they took part of my hamstring and they reconfigured it to make my own ACL. 
Do they not do that in dogs? Or I haven't it? seen anything about mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know if they could just use a graft or if they had to like keep all the stuff you went through or anything. Yeah, I haven't heard of it. It might be something to do with the fact that that's a traumatic injury versus a degenerative right. stuff. I don't know. Because mm -hmm. if it's mostly older dogs, then you're talking about other things and. Um, Go ahead, I'll let you point out other people that comment or question. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I've seen a TPLO in a um, boxer when I did an internship before. I know it was some sort of ACL surgery, but it was really um, invasive, and the dog was young and over 50 pounds, so I'm pretty sure that's probably why they chose that method. Mm -hmm. Now the thing is, <clears throat> since it happens to older dogs, right, what you should do, and you should actually do this when they're quite young, get them used to doing ramps or steps. Too many people let them jump out of a pickup. Well, you know, they get into that habit and then they get older and they shouldn't be jumping out, of course, right. the bigger dogs. So those puppies I've got, they already climb a ramp to get into the back of a car. Uh, and they love climbing. And it's, I've got one of these ramps that are like foldable. So it's like this long to put in the car but it goes three times that length, and it makes a nice little angle. So I would always say, try to get your dogs trained into not jumping, because you see advertisements even on the TV, there's this one by some dog food company I won't mention, but they start out showing this young puppy jumping in the car, then halfway middle age, and then the older dog, come on, you can do it. No, don't. <laughs> but they show it, and I'm thinking, I know they're selling dog food, but you just showed a bad technique because you shouldn't make that old dog because it's wear and tear, yeah. and you're just setting yourself up for something. So don't let them jump off beds. Get them used to a steps or ramps. I'm just a big proponent of that. And you should see how many kinds of steps and ramps there are out there. I mean, I've made some of my own, but I've got this one that pretty slick. It's about this long, and it's carpeted, and it it's like, it's not a piano thing, but it just slides into each other. There's like three sections and they all in, go into one and there's a handle on it and it's not that heavy. And so get them used to that really because there's too many people letting them jump out of high things, maybe helping them up, but that's hard. All that weight coming down, set yourself up for something later. Anybody else have any uh, stories, comments? Um, the clinic I've worked at, we do uh, TTA. We didn't start with the um, TPO, we just went to the okay. TTA. Um, and there's only one doctor that does it, and he'll do like three or four a day. Um, but we did one, there's one summer that I spent, he did one originally on a full size Great Dane. Um, and then he continued to break the plate that he had in his knee. So, like, it healed, then he would break it again, have to go back and fix it. And so the owners were just like, just take it out. Mm -hmm. it was, not worth it. Right. And it'd be <laughs> neat to know insane. what they were, what he was doing. Did they? Being an idiot. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah. So, and here's the other thing that you mentioned: the one doctor, the veterinarian that was doing it, did three or four a day. Mm -hmm. That's who you want to do them. You don't once. You don't want somebody that does it once a month or once every six months. You want somebody that does it like blindfolded. How right? long would it take? It then? Depends on the size of the dog. So, usually about forty-five minutes. Um, bigger dogs. That's probably a lot yeah. yeah. Because this it was a he. Is yeah. a he he's, <laughs> he's skilled at that. Forever. Yeah. Can you imagine somebody trying to do it and they're like practicing? Mm -hmm. No. Well, and he has a really good surgery assistant as well, yeah. so she knows. How yeah, to and she like she gets everything ready and it's a routine. That's who you want doing it though. Somebody that's a routine. 